Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Tokyo College webinar. I'm Flavia Baldari, a project researcher here at Tokyo College, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Before we begin, I would like to direct your attention to the interpretation button at the bottom of uh, the screen. If you prefer to listen to uh, the lecture in Japanese, please select the Japanese button for live English to Japanese interpretation. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Yuk Hoi, who was a visiting professor at Tokyo College until last month. Today, he will give a talk titled For a Technodiversity in the Anthropocene. Professor Hoi is currently a professor of the philosophy of technology at the City University of Hong Kong and the author of numerous publications on modernization and technology, the concept of the technology within different cultures and contexts, all questions that led to today's topic. Several of his monographs have been translated into multiple languages, among them on the existence of uh, digital objects, the question concerning technology in China and the state in cosmotechnics, recursivity and contingency, and art in cosmotechnics. Is, uh, he is also the editor of uh, Cosmotechnics for a Renewed Concept of Technology in the Anthropocene and Philosophy of uh, After Automation, among others. Professor Hoy has also been sitting as a juror of the Bergroom Prize for Philosophy and Culture since uh, 2020. As a researcher in philosophy myself, I am really looking forward to listening to his talk. Today's lecture will be followed by a commentary by Professor Okamoto Takuji, uh, a professor of history of science at the Graduate School of Arts and Science here at the University of Tokyo. Professor Okamoto's research interests cover the history of physics, the role of science and technology in the modernization of Japan, and science and political thought. After a commentary, the remaining time will be used for discussion. And if we have time at the end, we will have a short Q&A session. So one last uh, quick note for uh, the webinar audience. You can write your uh, questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Professor Hoy, the floor is yours. Right. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction. I hope you can hear me well. And I would, of course, I want to thank uh, the Tokyo College for welcoming me to the University of Tokyo, which was a great time. And I also want to thank Professor Okamoto for agreeing to uh, comment on this lecture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a slide um, with you. Um, so wait for a minute. Well, if you can, uh, if you cannot see, please let me know. Um, okay, I assume it we all can, works. We can see it. It's okay. Okay, I assume it works well. So, um, thank you everyone for coming to today's lecture. Um, um, I'm looking forward to the conversation with Professor uh, Okamoto, but also everyone of you. The subject uh, that I want to speak today is um, uh, what I call techno diversity. So, the title of this presentation is for a techno diversity in the Anthropocene. Um, I'm going to, because uh, I'm going to speak very briefly what I mean by technodiversity in the Anthropocene and why do I think uh, if I will succeed, uh, um, I should be able to convince you why it is necessary to talk about technodiversity. And uh, I will also explain how it's possible to approach the question of technodiversity today. Um, so here I want to show us a slide. In this slide, we will see, or if some of you may recognize, that is um, the uh, the Sputnik uh, launched by the Soviet Union um, in the last century. We've since the launch of the Sputnik, we have already we have gained, maybe we can call it a new consciousness of space, or new awareness of space. And in this, in this new awareness or this new consciousness of space, we are able to, and to grasp the Earth, that's to say, the planet as a whole. Now, this historical event was documented by or witnessed by several famous thinkers. First of all, I want to mention Hannah Arendt in his 1958 book, Human Conditions, where he says, 
a second in importance to no other, not even to the splitting of the atom. And later comment by the media theorist uh, Marcel McLuhan in, in 1974, Spooner created a new environment for the planet. Nature ended and ecology was born. Now we, we pay attention to the end of nature and the beginning of ecology. Ecological thinking became inevitable as soon as the planet moved up into the status of a work of art. So the Earth as a planet is now becoming an artifact, becoming a machine, a cybernetic, a cybernetic machine, more precisely. Now in the 1960s, as we can see, uh, the very uh, famous um, photos taken by the Apollo um, in the 1960s, uh, so this is one of one of one of, uh, one of them. That it is only the first time in history that we are able to see the Earth from outside, because normally we see the Earth by looking at our feet, you know, because we stand on the Earth. But here, what we see is that the um, um, it's the it was the first time that we were able to grasp the unity of the Earth. Uh, the unity of the Earth from outside. Now, in this sense, that the Earth, the planet, become an uh, artifact. What does it mean by, uh, by this fact that the Earth now, the planet, now become an artifact? Does it allow us to understand better the, the Earth? Does it allow us to, um, to think better the, the, the future of humanities? Um, today, what we as what we have seen, um, at least from from what we have heard in the media, for example, it seems that we are um, seeing or maybe we are hearing uh, something quite opposite. First of all, what we have seen is the arrival of the Anthropocene that was already claimed by the um, by the geologist about a decade ago. Now, what does it mean by Anthropocene? Anthropocene means that a new geological era where the human beings or the human activities, or more precisely, the human technical activities are affecting the biochemical uh, reactions or activities of the earth. Now, the human activities are in affecting the biochemical acti activities of the earth. Um, this is the, the the event of the Anthropocene. But the Anthropocene is also closely related to uh, biology, uh, to, to the ecological crisis. As we see today, uh, for example, uh, with mining of deforestation and so on and so forth. Um, that we see, if we look at this graph, we see that since the uh, Industrial Revolution, yeah, about, uh, let's say, uh, in the second half of the 18th century until now, there was a sharp um, increase in terms of the speed of uh, of the coming of the arrival of the Anthropocene, and that if we look closer, more closely um, at this graph, that the Anthropocene was largely speed up, uh, for example, in since the uh, 20th century, especially after the Second World War and until now. So this is one of the crises that we encounter today, the ecological crisis that, are, that um, um, closely associated with the Anthropocene, that how the human activities are affecting uh, the planet Earth. And that may lead to uh, extinction of the human species itself. Now, there's another crisis that, um, um, that is the arrival of the technological singularity. Now, this become very uh, popular, especially after the arrival of chat GPT, that chat GPT exhibited a certain kind of intelligence that become threatening. Um, if you uh, pay attention to the media, you probably saw that in the past two, three months, there has been a lot of uh, scientists who has been proposing to stop or to suspend the development of artificial intelligence. So these are the two major, maybe you can say, existential crises of the humankind. Um, um, 
But however, if you look at these two images, the one I show about the graph of the of the Anthropocene, as well as the arrival of the singularity, and again, maybe I briefly uh, explain what does it mean by technological singularity. Technological singularity means that um, the development of computation uh, until one moment when the computer or the machine is able to reflect mm -hmm. on itself, that's to say, to acquire consciousness. Now we have been we 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 have heard uh, a lot about the arrival of the of the uh, um of the technological singularity or singularity is near, for example, one of the uh, famous book of Ray Kurzweil, for example. Now these two graphs uh, show something very similar, as we, we can see that not only because we are seeing two exponentially increasing uh, graphs, if you look at the curves, uh, exponentially increasing. But also these two graphs precisely uh, describe a certain um, understanding of history. Uh, certain understanding of history, as well as the development of technology, which I described with this simple graph. Um, these two graphs, maybe we can say, characterize what we understand as the process of modernization, the process of modernization. Um, now, I want to differentiate between two terms, modernity and modernization. But because I have to be brief, so my definition will be brutal. Uh, that's to say, to be maybe too too abrupt, um, in uh, maybe too brief in terms of definition. Now, modernity for me means that uh, means an epistemological and methodological rupture which took place in. Uh, let's say in the 17th, uh, or if someone may argue earlier, already in the 16th century, in Europe. Now, modern, I repeat, modernity means an epistemological and methodological rupture um, which take place in Europe. They characterize what we call modernity. Now, modernization means the universalization of such form of epistemologies and methodologies. Uh, the universalization of this of, of a particular form of epistemology, uh, epistemology and methodology. Now, if I, I look at, we, we look at this graph and I'm going to uh, explain very briefly what does it mean. Um, we can say that since modernization and prior to modernization, we have colonization. But since the modernization, that we see the conversions of historical time towards one end point, towards the end point. Um, this end point is now called Homo Deus, if you refer to the popular books by the, histor by the Israeli um, historian, the end point, the end of time, uh, or um, the becoming God of human, the Homo Deus the homo sapien from homo sapien to homo deus. Or in the 1940s, what was called intelligence explosion, or now it is called a technological singularity. So the way we understand um, the, the technological developments and the, uh, the, view, the historical understanding accompanied by this particular view is actually a view of eschatology. That means the end of time. <clears throat> So may, maybe let me conclude that what I try, I've been trying to show is that the process of modernization uh, um, brought the different histori historical time towards a global essence of time. And now it is producing a certain um, impression, or at least it, it gives us the impression that we are moving towards a particular end be that the ecological crisis that I described earlier, or for example, the, uh, the, the, the arrival of technological sing singularity that have produced a lot of anxiety in the past, um, in, well, in the past month, uh, very fresh. 
uh, this process of modernization, of course, also underlines for me a lack of understanding of the question of technology or the concept of technology. Um, this is um, witnessed, for example, in the history of East Asia, which I think because most of us are from East Asia and we probably can understand better from uh, this. Now, I want to refer here to a particular um, lecture by the historian uh, Anna Tornby, where he described, he tried to explain why um, why the, the, the Far Easterns um, or the East Asians refused the European in the uh, um, 16th century and then opened the door in the 19th century. And one of his explanations is that in the 16th century, when uh, Western thought came to East Asia, um, technology and religion were combined together. So what was preached by the uh, missionaries were both technology, science, technology, and um, religion. But he thought that in the 19th century, what happened is that there was uh, already uh, in the 18th century, 17th, 18th century, there was already a separation between religion and technology in the West. So when in the 19th century, when Western science and technology came to East uh, Asia, it was more easily accepted as we, for example, um, uh, the technology was understood as something like an instrument, like a tool that we can see, for example, in the, uh, the different slogans produced in uh, Eastern uh, Asian countries uh, in the 19th uh, century. For example, in China, we find the Western uh, body and all the Western uh, thought, sorry, the, the Chinese thought and the Western youth. And uh, in Japan, there is the Japanese soul and uh, uh, Western knowledge. And in Korea, the Eastern Tao and the Western Qi, these are a slogan produced in the 19th century in order to appropriate, for example, uh, Western science and technology. And that to some extent contributes to such a historical, uh, such a view of history that we are witnessing, uh, we are seeing today. Now, what I'm trying to propose in regarding uh, what I call techno diversity is to think to what extent, uh, or is it possible to think of a different way uh, of history? And instead of um, worrying about the end of time, in, instead of uh, accepting an eschatological uh, time or eschatological history, which is a very Christian. Uh, um, since the beginning, can we think of a uh, divergence of time? And this divergence of time could only be possible uh, via questioning the, the concept of technology. Because if modernization, in, in the process of modernization, different historical time were brought together to the global access time by technology, then the reopening of history, the reopening of knowledge could only be done through the question of technology. So he, instead of uh, um, accepting such an eschatological time, I wanted to ask how is it possible to uh, think of a new opening of time? Um, Concerning the question of modernity, um, where maybe here we can even say overcoming modernity, and of course this reminds, probably remind many of you about what happened before the Second World War. In Japan, especially the Kyoto school thinkers who proposed to overcome modernity. But this, of course, is not only a Japanese phenomenon. In, in fact, we uh, in Europe uh, in the past 100 years, the call for overcoming modernity uh, has been heard uh, um, all the time. And more recently, uh, a group of anthropologists, um, uh, for example, Philippe Descoulin, who was a professor at the Collège de France um, and who retired uh, recently, 
together with other uh, scholars such as Bruno Latour, such as um, 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 Edward of Varelos, the Castro of um, a Brazilian anthropologist, have been trying to think uh, ways of overcoming modernity. Now, their, their approach or what they uh, suggest to do is to conceive what they call a multilateralism. Now, I, I, I reduce it to a, um, um, a little bit. The argument is more complex than that, but the conclusion is that um, in order to resolve the problem of the, this the end, they ask us to go back to the question, uh, to the concept of nature, because for uh, Philip de Scola, for example, the concept of nature that we inherit today, uh, even you know in Japan, in 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 Japan, it's translated as Shizen, uh, for example, and now even the concept of Shizen that we accepted is a very much a Westernized one. And that's to say, nature um, means something opposed to culture. Something uh, nature is something opposed to culture. Now, they, their, their proposal is that um, in order to resolve, the, to confront the problem, the ecological problem that we have today, then it is necessary to go back to the question of nature. And instead of uh, uh, um, following um, this concept of nature, which is a product of modernity, they propose to uh, look into different concepts of nature, for example, um, totemism, animism, um, analogism. So they found that, that there have been different kinds of nature uh, or different concepts of nature that we can find in uh, anthropologies. Uh, uh, in the ethnography of different uh, uh, cultures. So the one way to overcome modernity in their sense is to reopen the, que the question of nature and in order to understand the multiplicity of nature. That's why they propose what is called multinaturalism. That means, which in contrary to multiculturalism, means one culture and multiple natures. So we, the humankind formed one culture, but in one culture, we find a multiple nature that is opposed to what we understand about multiculturalism, which means there's one nature, and on this nature, we can find multiple cultures. So this is, um, um, in a nutshell, this is the proposal of the anthropologist. Uh, for me, I'm very skeptical of this vision. Uh, in fact, I try to propose, provoke and to propose that um, it's not possible to overcome the problem of modernity by only thinking about the question of nature. Even we are able to reopen the concept of, of, of nature and to um, allow the multiplicity of nature to, to, to continue developing, we still could not overcome the problem of modernization, which was uh, which relies very much on the materiality of technologies, uh, and this is uh, the reason for which I want to talk about techno diversity. Yeah. So first of all, I I try to show to you uh, the problem of the concept of, of history or the concept of time, that is the source of our fear today, the source of our our anxiety regarding the end of time um, that we associate with ecological crisis or with the robot rebels for revolts, for example. Um, secondly, I try to show that uh, one way to think about overcoming this is going back to the concept of nature. But I, I, I also want to produce uh, disagreements or to some extent, Henson with this, uh, with the proposal of Philip Nescola uh, and the other anthropologists anthropologist by trying to, to show that um, um, in their approach, there is, uh, they undermine very much the concept of technology. And um, I had the chance to have a dialogue with the 
uh, Brazilian um, anthropologist Eduardo Varelos de Castro, and we also talk exactly about this question of technology. Um, on this slide, you can find this uh, dialogue between us, and if you are interested, you can refer to this dialogue where we discuss about the, this problem. Um, now, how could we think about technodiversity? This is a very uh, difficult uh, question for us. Why? Because um, if we can see, um, uh, for example, um, um, here we, we refer to the sociologist, uh, French sociologist Jacques Ellu in his work, he's trying to, he has trying to show uh, that the understanding of technology is very homogeneous, um, very homogeneous, as what he said. What is called the history of technic usually amounts to no more than the history of machine. This very formulation is an example of the habit of intellectuals of regarding forms of the present as identical with those of the past. Um, we, of course, we think that technology is universal and so on and so forth. Um, that was also what is uh, conceived, for example, in the, in the 19th century. Um, and this is something I wanted to um, negotiate with, um, mm -hmm. just to say, to reopen the question of technology um, um, through my, the concept of technodiversity. However, there are several hurdles we have to go through um, because um, um, in different disciplines, when the question of technology was discussed, uh, it has been uh, very much um, um, understood as something universal, as something uh, which has to do with logic or which has to do, to do with causality. And this way of understanding technology, as I try to show, that is very much limited. However, in this in our academic disciplines, uh, such as that question of uh, um, the possibility the possibility of talking about techno diversity is also very much undermined. So I'm going to show to you um, um, very briefly um, how this um, has been a problem. Uh, for example, in philosophy of technology, in history of technology, and as well as in anthropology of technology. Now, in philosophy of technology, one of the most referred um, um, article um, is the one by Martin Heidegger, um, especially in the in the traditional continental philosophy uh, called the question concerning technology, where Heidegger trying to show that uh, in the uh, <clears throat> in the history of Western uh, thought. There's, there has been a shift in the concept of techniques uh, from the Greek technique to modern technology. So from mo Greek te technique to, mo uh, to, to modern technology. And in this shift, there is also a shift of the essence of techniques. Now the modern technology for him, or the essence of modern technology is not about production, is not about poetic, uh, or about bringing something forth but rather gestell. That means in modern technology, everything is understood as resource, what he called bestand, resource. Mm -hmm. Heidegger's uh, um, um, concept of technology or his understanding of technology has been widely uh, um, accepted in the West, but also in the East. Um, however, the question is, and I cannot explain banned here because it needs some time. But the question is that by accepting Heidegger's analysis of the history of technology, one already assumed that the Greek technology or the Greek technique is uh, the beginning of all techniques. And the Greek technique is the beginning of all techniques. And um, by accepting his thesis, which we also commit to such a blind spot. Uh, secondly, in the history of technology that um, as we know that um, um, there has been a haunting question from uh, uh, Joseph Needham. And Needham, um, the Needham question simply put is this, why modern science has not developed in Chinese civilization or India, but also in Europe? 
Now, after the Nehem's questions, many historians have been trying to show that no, actually, this is not true. If we look at the, um, um, for example, look at technologies before the 16th century, there were quite some uh, discoveries and inventions in China that were more advanced than Europe. So actually, there has been a kind of exercise in proving that a certain technology is more advanced than the other. But by doing so, we also assume a linearity of technological development, that all different technologies are actually the same. The difference, the difference is that some are more advanced than the other. Now, certainly, the anthrop in anthropology of technology, and I here refer to a, a particular um, important book by the anthropologist of technology, Andre de Hagoron, um, who in the um, in whose work is um, um, very important uh, for me, and I continue working on his work. Uh, um, even though his position is quite quite different from uh, Levi Strauss. Uh, uh, as some of you may know. But in the understanding of André Louis Goron, he tried to understand technology as two, in terms of two dimensions. Firstly, uh, as, you, um, as technology is the externalization of memory. For example, um, I'm, I'm now writing on this notebook and this is the extension of my memory. Uh, sorry, the externalization of my memory. Now I'm speaking to you with my computer and with this light. This is also the uh, externalization of memory. Uh, as well, the second dimension is the, the liberation of organs. For example, if I use fork uh, and knife, then I can liberate my finger to for eating. Now before, without um, knife and um, uh, for I will have to use my hand now. With uh, technology, I'm able to liberate my or my bodily organs. So this way of understanding technology, of course, it could be applied everywhere, universal. Uh, you can apply it in uh, China. You can apply in Japan. You can apply in Greece. Um, um. But in, 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 in contrast to what um, Lewis Gohan was saying, I proposed uh, what I called the, the uh, um, antinomy of the universality of technology. So antinomy means that there are, they, there are thesis and antithesis. When you look at each of them separately, um, um, each of them are correct. But when we put them together, we immediately see a contradiction. So the thesis runs like this. Technology is an anthropological universal understood as an externalization of memory and liberation of organs. As some anthropologists and philosophers of technology has formulated, antithesis. Technology is not anthropologically universal. It is enabled and constrained by particular cosmologies which go beyond mere functionality or utility. Therefore, there is no single uh, technology, but rather multiple cosmotechnics. A cosmotechnic is a term that I coined um, uh, several years ago, but I don't have time to explain. Here, I will briefly say that with through this um, antinomy of uh, universality of technology, I try to show, I try to argue that against all these uh, receptions in uh, all the receptions in these different disciplines, I wanted to argue for a techno diversity. Now, a techno diversity, how do we think about techno diversity? I want to come back to the Niham's, Niham's question. Because what Niham was trying to say, especially in his science and civilization in China, um, I want to. Um, even though now many some historians trying to show that uh, some inventions or discoveries in this uh, before the 16th century in 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 China was more advanced than Europe. Uh, however, this is not what uh, precisely not what Niham wanted to propose. What Niham was saying in his books is that 
we should be very careful when we compare Chinese technology and science with Western science and technologies because they are based on different epistemological, ontological, and cosmological assumptions. So I want to repeat that all these technologies cannot be compared as if they are the same because they all have different ontological, epistemological, and cosmological assumptions. Therefore, comparing one technology, for example, Chinese technology, for example, paper making, is more advanced than Western paper making in the second century. Uh, is problematic in itself because they ignored precisely these uh, the, all these assumptions that are inherited in uh, precisely in technology. Um, so we must radically uh, reopen the question of technology um, by um, by looking for concrete methodologies, how can we open these questions? Um, the, I wanted to name two approaches, and then I will, I will, I will um, stop the presentation um, and open the discussion with uh, Professor Okamoto. Now, how to, how to conceptualize uh, technodiversity? First of all, um, what I propose, especially in this book that was uh, published in uh, was translated into Japanese and published last year, the question concerning technology in China, I tried to reconstruct the um, uh, history of technological thought in China. Um, so instead of um, blindly accepting or uh, taking for granted that technology was first of all Greek, uh, but of course before Greek, it was also the uh, um, uh, from the Near East, for example. Um, I try to show that there, in China, for example, there are different ways of thinking about technology. And this could be summarized in two, uh, in the understanding of two categories. One is Tao, um, the other is Qi, or Qi in Japanese. I do, um, I don't think I have to explain too much about these two, ca two categories. But what I'm trying to show is that the Tao and Qi, these two categories actually um, carries um, a systematic thought about technology, which we have to reformulate. Uh, we have to reconstruct uh, retrospectively. So, which allow us to think uh, about the, uh, the the about different uh, uh, or about the diversity of technological thought, which was not done. Um, once I was asking my uh, Indian some Indian scholars, what um, is there a concept of technology in India? But it was um, everyone was silent. Um, so first of all, the first approach is uh, from um, the perspective of culture uh, to reconstruct different technological thought and for us to think uh, in order to, uh, to ask what is the relevance of this thought. Uh, I repeat, to ask what is the relevance of this thought uh, in relation to the technological development today. So one dimension, firstly, the cultural historical dimension, the second dimension, as I said already, is um, where it doesn't have to go through such a historical um, analysis of culture. As I mentioned earlier, that the technical object contains in itself a set of ontological, epistemological, and cosmological assumptions. We can understand through the perspective of culture, but uh, we can also directly question uh, especially today, the the, the, the technologies we use. Um, and I want to give a brief example about social networks. And this was a project that I, I did uh, more than 10 years ago um, um, in France. So today, 
if we think of social network, we think that uh, the social network is composed of uh, individuals, individual users, and each individual user is considered as an atom. Each, each individual is considered as an atom in itself. The society is the aggregation of these individual atoms together. They form, they form a group. This is our concept of uh, social network. So there is already ontological assumption. That's to say each individual exists as a social atom. There is also an epistemological assumption that the social relation could be drawn, could be known by making a line between two uh, atoms. Now, if we, if we look at this graph, um, we can see that the social relation could be known by plotting a line between multiple points. Each point is a, a representation of a social atom with the individual. Um, this was actually, this model of social network was already proposed in the 1930s by um, by the uh, um, uh, psychosociologist. For example, here I mentioned uh, Jakob Levi Moreno, an Austrian uh, psychologist who immigrated to the state. And this model of social network is adopted today. Um, we can find in social, in uh, Facebook, on uh, Twitter, um, we checked uh, all kind of social network. But as I said, that in this technology, there, it already contains uh, a particular set of assumptions. And these assumptions has to be challenged. This, uh, these assumptions could be challenged. And by challenging these assumptions, we can propose alternative assumptions uh, to uh, think about developments of, um, of alternate, alternative technologies. So for example, uh, this was one uh, as, um, project uh, I did uh, more than a, a decade ago, uh, is to create a social network based on group, but not based on individuals. So in this social network that the individual is no longer the basic unit of the network, the basic unit of the network will be a group, will be a collective. Now, this is a, a, a very brief example to explain um, the approach towards technodiversity. If I allow myself to repeat, the first one is that we have to, up to, to deepen our understanding of the diversity of technological thought, which we can um, we, we, we can do by revisiting uh, the history of thought and to reconstruct such thought and to think the relevance of such thought in related to contemporary technology. And this is a very different from uh, earlier when we talk about uh, the reception of technology in the 19th century in East Asia. So first, uh, this is first dimension. The second dimension, um, is to question uh, the technology that we use because the technology we use already inherits a particular, um, maybe you can say the modern um, epistemology and, auto, uh, and, and ontology. And all this could be questioned in order to, uh, in a very pragmatic sense or very practical sense, to reopen uh, or to, to, to um, research on alternatives. Um, now, I wanted to conclude here that only with the question of technodiversity, where I believe that we are able to open the imagination of a new historical time. And this, uh, only the te with uh, the technodiversity, we are able to conceive, for example, a new diversity, different ways of thinking, because thinking relies also on material support. And since the 20th century, we have heard too much about, about the criticism of the homogeneity of, our, of the modern time. Um, this homogeneity is produced also through the technological process. Uh, 
consumerism and so on and so forth. And only through the question of technodiversity, we are able to renew our relation to the non-human beings. That's to say, to allow uh, biodiversity to forest again. So uh, to briefly conclude, the concept of technodiversity is a means for which to reopen the question of technology that has been um, undermined in, in, in maybe we can say in different academic disciplines, but also to think about the diversification uh, or um, that is necessary for us to, over, to, to confront the two problems that I defined at the very beginning. First of all, the ecological problem, and secondly, the, uh, the, the, the fear of artificial intelligence um, or similar kind of technology. So I will stop here and I thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to discussion with you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hoy, for your insightful talk, uh, talk <clears throat> and your original view about uh, technodiversity. Now we will have uh, a comment by Professor Okamoto, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your stimulating discussion. Um, before directly um, um, responding to your discussion, I would like to propose uh, one question, um, which is the mainstream of my talk, my response today. The question is, how is diversity possible? I mean, the, yeah, you talked about the importance of diversity in many ways, uh, in many senses, especially the techno diversity, especially the importance of techno diversity. But the, the question, my question is, um, in the age of globalization or in the age of Anthropocene, what will guarantee diversity, be it techno diversity, new diversity, biodiversity, or diverse cosmo technologies? And uh, I'd like to share one example from history of science, um, which shows paradoxically setting and sharing one goal, one unified, loosely unified, loosely set goal can induce um, diversity unexpectedly. Um, some, un some unexpected diversity can follow uh, by sharing one unified um, 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 goal. And I take this example from the history of science in Japan, modern history of science in Japan. So let me show you why. So the, my, my, the contents of my talk is gonna uh, proceed this way. I'll show you the example from uh, uh, 1870s and 1880s. And then I'll, I'll, I'll summarize the lesson we can learn from that example. And then, then we come back to the present time and what uh, or how we can frame uh, this kind of uh, uh, a unified, loosely unified goal that can allow, that can guarantee diversity in technologies. So uh, the first example is the uh, a proposal by a Japanese diplomat, Mori Arinoi, who, uh, who happened to be uh, the first uh, minister of education in modern Japan. And then when he was uh, sent to uh, the United States as a minister there in 1872, uh, then he was a charge d'affaires for the legation of Japan. And he asked the scholars, especially linguists and the educators in the United States, uh, uh, asked, for, asked the, them for their opinions about his proposal of adopting English as Japan's, Japan's official language. He thought English is uh, more a convenient, logical, and more powerful, and it will be more useful for commerce or industry or the military affairs. So he, he tried to change uh, one, one nation's language entirely into uh, English. And, uh, and uh, with a little, a little bit of modification, um, he didn't like the irregular uh, conjugation of verbs. And uh, instead of uh, uh, the conjugation like being brought, brought this irregular, uh, instead of this irregular conjugation, he, pro he proposed more regular conjugation, such as bring, bring, bring. Or that he liked the orthography. And uh, instead of writing though, 
th o u g h uh, instead of writing this way he proposed to write it in t h o though orthography something is agreed but the, the this kind of uh, regular uh, forceful regular uh, conjugation they they didn't like As, and more than that the linguist modern linguist did not think did not like this idea of uh, adopting body language um, um, as one country's uh, official language. One year linguist, William Dwight Whitney, uh, explained why he didn't like this idea. Um, the justice to the masses of the Japanese population requires the vernacular to be made for them a means of higher culture. Uh, to put it simpler, um, um, the education should be done in one's country's native language. You shouldn't, you, you shouldn't adopt other countries' language for the education. But still, Mori Arinori liked this idea and insisted upon uh, accepting his, uh, his idea as an educational policy, but it didn't, it didn't succeed. Uh, Japanese, uh, some intellectuals and also the politicians did not this idea and did not adopt uh, this idea of Mori's uh, uh, about uh, uh, using uh, English, borrowing a uh, foreign language as, it's, uh, as their country's official language. However, soon afterwards, um, some Japanese started use, started write, speak, and write, uh, speak, write, and uh, uh, use language, uh, foreign language more fluently than Mori expected, and many more languages than Mori expected. One example is this one. This is a letter written by Hantaro Naraoka, a Japanese physicist, and this was written in 1888 to his uh, senior colleague, uh, Tanakadate Aikits, who was then studying uh, in the United Kingdom. He says, uh, he could, the, the reason why he, he wrote this letter in English, he explained in this uh, letter, uh, I read, there's no reason why the whites shall be so, ex so supreme in everything. And as you say, I hope that we shall be able to beat uh, those yatcha bocha, yatcha bocha means disorganized, yatcha bocha people in course of 10 or 20 years. I think there is no use of observing the victory, victory of our descendants over the whites with the telescope from jigoku. Jigoku means hell. It's no use of observing our descendants victory over the whites, over the Europeans, over the Westerners after we die. So he, he, he wanted to see his descendants' victory over whites while he was still alive. Another great wicked uh, uh, is in, beat, in beating those whites is how to make our work known. This is a great difficulty. As a first step, we cannot write in Japanese and make the whites understand our writings. We must borrow their languages and make the whites understand our writings. Actually, he wrote, uh, I transcribed uh, his letter, uh, the following. So uh, the population, English population in Japan was uh, more limited than Mori expected, but uh, this uh, small uh, population uh, was actually a multi and they used them, they were multilingual. Uh, Nagaoka stressed the importance of uh, learning not just English. Uh, he proceeded to learn German, French, and other foreign languages, Western languages. So, so in, in a sense, in this sense, the diversity broadened unexpectedly. Uh, what can we learn from this, uh, these two examples? Imposing the adoption of English did not work. This kind of forceful policy did not work. But uh, pursuing the young, young generation of uh, Japanese scholars, Japanese intellectuals started to pursue a little bit more broad and goal, such as victory in the international, inter intellectual, international intellectual competition in scientific research. And this kind of goal led to more diversified results, such as uh, Japanese young intellectual challenge to Western authorities. In return, the, the international intellectual world was enriched by the challenge of this uh, Japanese young generation. 
So this and this shift, uh, interesting thing is that this shift occurred spontaneously. No one forced them to fight against whites. <laughs> I use this one. I'm, I'm, I bought this one from Nagamaka, but I, I have no bad intention about uh, Westerners. <laughs> I don't call them whites. But Nagoka called them whites. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for him. And this shift occurred spontaneously. This kind of uh, very, the libel, the feeling of liability was not forced. And this came out spontaneously. So this kind of uh, goal, loosely and spontaneously set, can allow diversity or diverse, more diverse approaches, and sometimes with unexpected, unexpectedly fruitful results. Now we come back to the present time, and uh, probably this kind of uh, 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 framing of the question to your discussion um, may be uh, out of focus, but uh, uh, and also, and uh, in taking example from the present time, maybe a little bit uh, uh, um, uh, inappropriate. But uh, uh, if we come back to a more realistic approach, we can probably ask this kind of question. What can be goals that will enhance the diversity of technology in the age of Anthropocene? Uh, now we talk about uh, carbon neutrality by 2050, or, or we talk about uh, holding global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius about pre-industrial pre level, or a total shutdown of nuclear power station. We, have, we, we see these uh, uh, rigidly uh, specified goals but will they allow, uh, will it be suitable for techno diversity or will it be suitable for the diversity of uh, um, um, ideas, diversity of technological challenges? Or if we step back a little bit uh, backward, uh, we might, we might uh, backward from and take some distance from the environmental concerns. We maybe uh, think of uh, uh, distribu distributing uh, economic resources more efficiently such as uh, for the prevention or the eradication of infectious diseases. For example, tuberculosis still uh, uh, um, claims 1.4 million lives each year. And pro probably it will be better to um, share more, more resources to this kind of effort. Or something much looser, or we can, we can be more relaxed and we can um, um, set a goal, something much looser, such as um, on, on a more abstract goal, such as well-being of human beings. So this is uh, my question and my 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 discussion, um, and uh, as a response to uh, Professor Hui's uh, uh, lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Okamoto, for this uh, comment and for bringing us back to some very timely and concrete. Uh, question. So, uh, Professor Hoy, do you have uh, an answer to these big questions, or do you want to add something? Please go ahead. Right. Um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Okamoto, for these uh, questions and also very uh, interesting um, episode in history because I think what you said actually introduced many uh, problems that we have to tackle question of nationalism, the question of uh, uh, the antagonism of cultures, or the more recent problem that we are confronting, uh, ecological problems, the question of carbon dioxide, and so on. Um, in general, I would think that, yes, probably we need to go to uh, develop uh, to, uh, as, as like what you said, um, to reduce the carbon emission, all these kind of goals to um, gather everyone to find different ways to uh, respond. But I want to also to, whether, but there was um, also problems to, uh, related to what you have said about the general, uh, loosely general goals. For example, uh, we have been talking about peace, but we always have wars. I think everyone wants to have peace. But we are witnessing wars and probably more wars. We have been talking about happiness, you know, uh, since to to two thousand five hundred years or even longer. Um, but still, we have we see so much suffering. 
we have been talking about uh, climate change, but at the same time, uh, as you know, that um, in 2015, Donald Trump refused, declined that there was such a problem of climate change. Uh, the climate denial is still present. Um, and um, in 2020, when Bruno Latour had the mega exhibition in Taiwan, in, ta a type in Taipei, uh, and he invited me to be the advisor of his uh, work in Taiwan, uh, the title of his exhibition was called We Live on Different Planet. We Live on Different pa Planet. Mm -hmm. in, in the sense that uh, there is certain you know, we all live in the same on the same planet, of course, but but um, there is such a denial that we actually we live on different planets, and we could not really think about um, um, even about the fact that we, we live on the same planet. But instead, we refuse and we decline, and um, we don't want to confront this problem. So I, I would say that what you said is interesting. I think it's important, but at the same time, I think it's also um, very complicated to say that there could be a general goal that we can address. Um, this also reminds me of what happened in 2019 when the, um, when the UN Secretary, Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, in the in, in Davos, in the in the Dava, during the Davos conference, he said we need a generalized solution to resolve the problem that we have. But it doesn't seem to me that uh, there is a generalized solution to the problems. Uh, I think there should be diverse response to uh, these to these problems. But more importantly, I think we should be very conscious to develop such a, a diversity. Um, because in the past, we, we know that uh, diversity could be produced, for example, by the environment. When the technology is trans transmitted um, from one tribe to another tribe, well, let's say about, talk about, uh, uh, about the, 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 the ancient time, that the selection of the technology, the transformation of the technology as a way to adapt to the uh, environment um, also produce difference and these were very important differences. However, in the process of modernization that I have been trying to describe throughout this talk, such a form of spontaneous uh, diversification is uh, rendered uh, um, very difficult, if not impossible. So what I was trying to suggest is that uh, we have to think of this process of diversification more consciously and to develop methodologies to address this concrete, uh, to, do, to, this, um, um, to this process of uh, diversification. And I, I, I mean really literally um, methodologies uh, like what I'm trying to suggest uh, by looking into, by reconstructing uh, history of thought, uh, especially history of technological thought, or uh, find a concrete methodology to, uh, crit to uh, critique or to challenge the dominating epistemologies uh, of computer uh, development and so on. I think the, for me, this is a very, very, very um, uh, something that we, ha we, we have to enforce um, in, in the education, because I also re re remember that when I met you in the uh, last time in the uh, Komaba campus, we also talked about the problem of uh, of um, education of engineering, um, especially that this kind of epistemological questions were never really taught or discussed in the engineering uh, discipline. And that also make it uh, difficult for engineers to raise this kind of problem. But instead, uh, speed and uh, efficiency dominates uh, the, the direction of thinking. Um, so this uh, will, will be my my first response to your uh, um, to to your to to the first point you make regarding 
looking for a, a common goal. But there was something I also find quite interesting, and I think we have to address is um, the examples and that you gave about uh, about the development of, or the maybe let's say the tension between uh, the Japanese intellectuals and uh, and the um, uh, uh, and Western culture. What I was trying to suggest is not going back to any kind of nationalism because I'm first of all against nationalism, um, but rather to think how can we achieve uh, from um, culture or, or, or history of thought uh, resources that allow us to respond to this to these uh, questions, but not only to um, think about the question of advancements, uh, like what you said uh, about how to uh, use the, the uh, um, um, uh, what you, you called about the, the use the, the telescope and the, the hair and so on. Um, because that very much reminds me of what happened, uh, let's say 50 years after, because we are talking about 1888. That in 1931, there was a book published by a German reactionary Oswald Spengler, who was also famous for his book, The Decline of the West. But the 1931 book was called uh, uh, Der Mensch und die, und, 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 und die Technik, uh, Human, a Man and Technik. And in this book, he gave uh, the example of Japan. He said, uh, he said uh, and I quote almost like this, like this, he said, the biggest, the biggest mistake that the right has committed um, during the turn of the century is to export technology to Japan. <laughs> now, after, especially after Japan defeated Russia, he said, now our students of the past time became our teacher. Uh, that uh, the, the, the controversy that you mentioned, I think was very much concluded by Spengler's 1931 book uh, in his commentary on, on Japan. But however, this is not what I want to say about going back to a kind of nationalist uh, approach towards technology. Uh, but more significantly is the, for me, is the imperative of diversification. And uh, such a diversification could be expressed uh, firstly through the question of technology and the uh, um, new diversity, uh, as I mentioned towards the end, new means uh, thinking the diversity of thinking and uh, biodiversity. Uh, that will be my, my brief uh, response to your uh, brilliant uh, uh, comment on, on my lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hoy. Do you want to add something? Yeah, it's just a, a, a very brief uh, question. Okay. Um, um, will this idea of uh, uh, setting some goal, some uh, um, um, very loosely defined goal. Um, does this is this idea? Uh, um, um, I mean, uh, it, does this idea fit well to your scheme? I mean, you 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 um, you explain the importance of diversity in technological approaches, and I understand that uh, that might be might be important. But uh, for what? Do you insist upon the, the importance of diversity of technology? What will bring? What will? What this, does this idea of a diversity of technology bring to us? Or is it just uh, some uh, scholarly interest out of some scholarly interest, or does this have any implication in practical matters? Or, or you expected that, or, or which which direction you are in? That, that's my brief question. Right, I think this is uh, the question of techno diversity for me is uh, a response to the first two scenarios that I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk. First of all, is the question of the ecological crisis. And this ecological crisis is produced by the universalization of a particular set of epistemologies, let's say in the process of modernization. So it's a direct response to this um, un process of universalization that I, I propose the question of uh, uh, the, the concept of techno diversity. Secondly, uh, is as a response to 
uh, a very homogeneous understanding of technology and that is uh, very popular in our time, especially concerning artificial intelligence. Uh, that we only have a very, um, um, in the past years, um, when I was teaching in Germany and in Hong Kong, I, in, in every of my class, I tried to ask my students always the same question, what do you, th what do you think about your future? I always, I always do this survey to my students. And I started doing this in, the, let's say, in two, five years ago, 2018, I started working on this. And I was, uh, 2018, I was uh, very much uh, shocked when I first do this to my German students. I have about uh, 40 students in my class, in philosophy class, and I asked them, what do you think about the, your future? And 90% uh, feel miserable. Uh, feel miserable because they think that the technological developments is already, uh, you know, with the rise of AI and so on, they're not going to get the job and the ecological crisis, there's no end uh, and so on. Uh, only one student was very excited, think very op positive about future, and but this student has a major in international business. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a very uh, interesting um, scenario for me, but it was also very shocking for me uh, that I feel that we are responsible for the misery of of the of the young generation. Um, but for me, my according to my diagnosis, that the problem, the anxiety, the fear, the misery, the misery that we feel today is precisely because of this process of development that we feel helpless. And we don't know how to respond to this. Um, so the two scenarios that I raised at the very beginning, one concretely about ecology, uh, and um, um, the secondly about uh, the future of technology, and so on, uh, what I try to respond to with the concept of techno uh, diversity. And uh, as a way, and, and if you ask me what exactly is it going to lead to, uh, of course, I cannot say that what exactly is goal is because then I would kind of impose a, a, a program to that. But I feel that in order to overcome this um, difficulty that we are seeing today, we need to rethink, to think very concretely and methodologically how to reopen the question or how to how to think about diversification uh, is not only about thinking, is not only about scholarly writing, but also, um, as what I said, methodologically and um, epistemologically, how can we address this? Thank you. Uh, thank you. But in many cases, you know, um, we cannot force anyone to set specific goal. These kind of goals can be um, formed um, um, spontaneously without any outside uh, um, force. That, that's usually the case. And this kind of shared goal will allow diversity. And not, not really like, uh, it's not like uh, someone thinks of uh, a, a new good goal and everyone goes for, see, for, it, for that. It's not like that. This kind of goal is shared um, spontaneously, uh, without uh, any other outside force, um, and that's that's what I find in the history of uh, science or technology. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. I, I agree with you because I think that um, uh, there's one way is that we start with the common and then we look for difference, and the different way is that we affirm the difference, then we look for the common. Mm -hmm. Um, there was an episode, and I always wanted to uh, share this episode. is a, a book by uh, the French historian called uh, Paul Azad, uh, called uh, the uh, the Crisis of the European Mind, and he talked about nineteen about sixteen um, seventy five, I think nineteen sixteen seventy five, when the French, when Louis XIV, Louis XIV, sent the missionaries to 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 Thailand. So the missionaries arrive in Thailand and they want to convert the king, uh, the same king into a Christian. And the king replied, if it were what God want, it would be too simple. God would, be, would like to see the heterogeneity 
uh, um, because hom homogeneity would be too simple as task of God. And the missionary was very shocked. You know, they, they, they didn't expect this. So I think uh, I agree that uh, uh, the kind of uh, this spontaneity, but the commonness would be uh, maybe I can we can say that since the Enlightenment, it has been such an idea that we let's look for the common and then we look for the difference. But I think um, the other way is also possible is that we look for diversification and in which we find common. That we would be my response. Yeah. Should we accept any question? From the yeah, yes, we have uh, some questions uh, from the audience, but before, may I uh, pose a follow up question to the discussion we are doing? So, um, regarding the, the last discussion that we had, I, if maybe it sounds simple, this question, I don't know, but the uh, idea of diversity is, is rooted in really different. Um, different worldviews, if, if I can say it. So in different uh, cultures and contexts and uh, morals. So it's this very completely different worldviews. So I was thinking, how do you think this diversity can really, and this diverse um, worldviews or uh, views on technology can um, communicate to each other? So in a globalized uh, society in, in which we live and we share problems that we have, how can in practice this diverse idea uh, communicate and above all view the um, or communicate against this um, pretense of universalization of uh, European modern technology? Uh, right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, uh, this is a very key question. First of all, I think. Uh, uh, I would want to say that the diversification is also maintained uh, by certain material infrastructure, for example, technology. So let's say, for example, the concept of nature today, that we can say that the anthropologists could say that in the past, mm -hmm. there have been different concepts of nature, but now we are seems to reduce to a certain particular, to a particular concept of nature is because of the technological developments in the global sense that they homogenize or reduce the multiplicity of the concept of nature. And I think this is a, a key, a big question in Japan, for example, to talk about Zen, and also in China to, to go to come back to the question of, of Zen, but of course the, the, the uh, the use of uh, the Ch the Chinese use of Cizen to trans to translate nature was actually an importation from Japan. In that, in, in, in as you as we see, that this process of 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 globalization uh, and inevitably produced a certain uh, kind of homogenization. But there was some historical mistake as well, which I think we can discuss today. Uh, no, the, the, your question is that how we are in a globalized world, then how are we going to uh, communicate with technodiversity? Now, I must emphasize that by technodiversity, I do not mean that everyone invents their socket. <laughs> so then you can use, uh, when you travel to somewhere else, you can never use the electricity and so on. No, I, what I'm trying to say is that in this process of uh, diversification, actually, we allowed, uh, we can challenge the dominating epistemologies uh, or epistemological, ontological, and cosmological assumptions in our technologies. And in order for us really to, 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 um, to think, to relatively open the question well, I, I will I will re, I will formulate it as the question of democracy, uh, um, because precisely today when we think about we 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 fail to address the question of democracy and technology, we only think of technology as a means, for example, for voting, of producing a platform, and so on and so forth. But I think there is a more profound relation between democracy and technology that we still have to address. And that is grounded on for me the question of techno diversity, but it doesn't mean that we are going. I'm proposing to develop to develop different uh, 
electricity standards and that no one can uh, you know no one can communicate that's not what i'm trying to to show but for example i give you example the example that i talk about about um social network it doesn't mean that we are going to change computers it only say that we are going to develop applications that based on uh, alternative different epistemologies and and uh, ways of interaction and so on one, one, one possible answer to your question is that uh, entering the scientific world, I mean, the, uh, uh, the uh, young Japanese intellects um, in the modern age, uh, in the early modern period, found that entering into the international competition, it's a hostile world, but, and many people come with different motivation, but they share one rule, uh, one set of rules that govern science. And then fighting in this field, by fighting or by entering the fight in this field, they share some, some values, although they have different ideas and different motivations for entering this competition. Uh, that's one of, the, <laughs> and one of the answers that the uh, mage young intellects found. Thank you. So I will uh, pick some questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is uh, from Trent Brown. Interesting that you did not mention capitalism in your talk. Uh, do you see changes in productive relations and the accumulation of capital surpluses playing a powerful role in the development of science and technology and transforming cosmologies? Uh, you're muted, we cannot hear you. Thank you very much, uh, Terence, for this uh, question. I think this is a big question that deserves a series of uh, uh, of seminars on on the question of capitalism, uh, of course, capitalism plays a, a a very important role in the. Uh, but I think it's a very important. Uh, but I'm not sure if I will be able to elaborate all this here because, um, uh, in order to address your question, we need to reread Marx. We have to to um, to uh, reread Marx's uh, understanding of machines and the uh, relation between machines and capital in the writing of Marx. Uh, for example, in order to assess this question, especially in the Gunderiza, when Marx describes machines, uh, um, machines as fixed capitals and machines as a way to uh, produce surplus labor time. Now, this is, imp this is important. Uh, but at the same time, I think in that, uh, the both machines and both uh, capitals that Marx described in uh, Wunderiser or in uh, Capital are all subject to uh, the history of epistemology, the history of epistemology, in the sense that, first of all, machines evolve over time. Secondly, uh, capitalism evolves over time. And this could be read from the perspective of epistemology. Um, so what I'm trying to show is, um, all the, in, throughout the talk, I emphasize a lot on the question of epistemology. And I think, um, because for me, it's not about uh, destroying capitalism, it's about uh, eliminating capitalism. Uh, no, because precisely capitalism is a form of epistemology or it operates according to certain form of epistemology. For example, if we look into the, to, uh, to the uh, economic theory, um, the evolution from neoclassical economy based on Newtonian um, classical mechanics to thermodynamics that is associated with the neo neo neoliberalism and so on and so forth. Um, I think this is uh, um, we need a different we need an, uh, a, a different way to look at capitalism and its relation to machines or technology in general. Uh, however, I cannot really um, elaborate on these points here because of the, the lack of time. But I would simply say that both the machine, both technology and capital, has to be read through through the history of epistemology and th this is actually 
um, my, uh, the subject of my of my new new book, uh, which will be published by uh, University of Minnesota Press. Um, I don't know exactly when, maybe next year. Okay, thank you. And then we have a couple of other questions. Now we we have uh, only five minutes left, so um, maybe a, <laughs> a, a an easy one. I don't know. There are some attendees who are uh, asking. It seems to me that there is an assumption that uh, access is possible to share the diversity of technology, but there are many possible factors that could prevent that access: language, culture, politics. As uh, already mentioned by uh, Professor Okamoto um comments, so should this be uh, overcome now? So how how do how do we overcome these diverse these uh, these obstacles? And another one is asking technological technology diverse uh, is not what about not technology diversity but interdisciplinary? What about this difference? So maybe it's the last the last one we really don't have much time. You're still muted. <laughs> well, thank, you, thank you very much. There are many, actually, there are quite, quite some interesting questions. Uh, but I'm sorry that I apologize that maybe we won't be able to address all of them. But regarding the two questions that you raised, uh, one is about interdisciplinarity. The other is about uh, access to to uh, to technologies. And uh, but at the same time, I feel that the problem that we confront today is a scenario that you describe uh, that uh, is a really serious uh, uh, political problem that we are confronting. Is that uh, of course, technology is very important for uh, international politics um, uh, because technology is essential for wars uh, and so on and so forth. But in the recent years, what we see is the access to technology or maybe say, let's say the technology bec become and, and not necessarily um, military technology become the frontier of geopolitics. Um, if you look at the, the debates about uh, microchips uh, and uh, what what the, it is it, the building of uh, new microchips uh, factories in Kumamoto in Japan, or uh, the um, uh, Japan government's new policy to ban certain exportation of of technologies, uh, of um, especially microchips, and um, it's I think more than ever we are seeing that. Uh, all this technology become the technology become the 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 really grounding uh, problem for for uh, geopolitics and politics. Uh, and um, on the other hand, we are seeing that uh, the technology become the base of uh, the two processes and that it is uh, leading nowhere. And these two processes are uh, economic competition and military expansion of uh, sovereign state. And I think if this continues, so we probably will not have, um, uh, probably we, we, we are going to, to end up really badly. Um, that is also the reason for which I try to propose the concept of techno diversity and its relation to political philosophy. I know that Favier has a specialist of political philosophy, but I've been trying to work on that as well. Uh, now, the, 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 to, uh, briefly, the second, so so in all response to the first question about access, I think is a, also because there is a lack of under, uh, development of techno diversity. Um, the second question is interdisciplinarity. Uh, of course, this is a key question, and I think everyone has been talking about interdisciplinarity. Um, but I earlier I referred to my discussion with uh, Professor Okamoto um, last month in Todai about uh, at Todai about uh, the the education pedagogical problem as well. Um, but I think it's not only about interdisciplinarity, but the creation of new disciplines. That the new disciplines that we know because when, whenever we want to bridge. To disciplines actually we are deepen also the gap between them 
you know, we thought that we are bridging them, but actually by bridging, we divide them. Uh, this is a paradox, but uh, maybe it is a, uh, it, it seems to me very important to think about new 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 programs or new disciplines that really allow us to be able to uh, integrate engineering uh, humanities and so on. I know that this is also one of the mission the mission of the liberal arts uh, at Todai. Uh, but that would be my brief response to that. Thank you. So now we don't have time, so I have to uh, close today's session. I would like to once again thank Professor Hoy for being uh, here today and Professor Okamoto. I also want to thank the audience for staying with us. And you can find the latest information on uh, Tokyo College, on our website, uh, Mail Magazine, and our social media profile. Thank you, and I hope to see you uh, again next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.